Hey, welcome to EPN. My name is Victor Lucas. We'll be bringing the latest in everything cool every single day. We've got an incredible EP live for you today. Thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to thank everybody that I met at Fan Expo Vancouver. It was an impromptu visit. I didn't really have a lot of time to kind of, you know, hype up the fact that I was going to be down there, but I got to hang out with uh, uh, Metropolis Comics and Toys, which is right out by uh, Metro Town in, uh, in the Vancouver Burnaby area. They had a booth and they uh, welcomed me with open arms and I met quite a few people which was really cool and uh, some people picked up some shirts and I asked them to send me pictures so we may be taking a look at a few of those a little bit later but right now it's time to get going with the rundown exploring the old west and red dead redemption 2 is probably going to keep you busy all winter. The main story campaign in the new Cowboy game is reportedly more than 65 hours long. That's according to New York Magazine, which in a new interview with Rockstar Games co-founder Dan Hauser estimated the playtime after seeing the game's massive voice acting script. It's unclear how many side missions and world exploration is included in that estimate, but either way, this would make Red Dead Redemption 2 the longest Rockstar game ever. All that hard work takes time. In the same story, Dan Hauser confirms that the game has been in development ever since the last Red Dead game came out in 2010 with many members of the team working 100-hour weeks during the crunch time over the last year. Rockstar has been criticized for overworking their employees in the past, but there's no denying that they make some of the best games in the world. Red Dead Redemption 2 lands a week from Friday, and I read that uh, wonderful story from Harold Goldberg, who put this all together. He's a terrific guy, a veteran in the video game industry, and I was so jealous that he had so much access to the Rockstar folks. Um, I interviewed Dan Hauser, I think, for Grand Theft Auto 3, and that's the last I've seen of the Hauser brothers, you know, because they've gotten so successful with their franchises and they are at the top of their class, you know. They really understood the value of the interactive medium and storytelling and creating mystery and uh, creating, uh, I guess, a hype of sort of value or, you, you know, you can kind of see that the hype is going to be worth it with their products. They really take the time to make these things stories with incredible characters and, um, you know, moments that you're going to remember forever. There's resonance in all of their work. And one of the things that I did find interesting in that article, good job, Harold, is uh, that they really moved away from casting known actors. They really feel like they get a more authentic sound from hiring people that people aren't really familiar with uh, and then they become these characters and they're I guess a little bit more malleable they have less ego and stuff they brought up uh, some kind of a confrontation that uh, one of the Hauser brothers had with Burt Reynolds which I thought was pretty funny uh, but yeah man I can't wait that date is coming up very soon and I'm going to be juggling a lot of stuff. I'm going to be super busy because I'm in Toronto next week working um, with the Escapist show. Uh, but I'll be piping in some uh, rundowns for you uh, while I'm on the road. But, uh, oh man, I can't believe that Red Dead Redemption 2 is almost here. It looks like abandoning single player hasn't hurt the Call of Duty franchise at all. The latest entry, Black Ops 4, is already the fastest selling game in the franchise's history. Sort of. Activision claims that the new game, which was just released on Friday, was the best selling day one release on both the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live, giving it the best digital launch in history. They haven't revealed how well it's sold in brick and mortar stores, which makes it impossible to compare to other Call of Duty games, so this could just signal a trend towards digital distribution. Still, this is good news for Call of Duty and Activision. There was some doubt about how successful the new game would be, given that it drops the traditional single-player campaign in favor of online-only content, so it looks like the franchise won't be hurting as a result. I was playing a little bit over the weekend, and I have been enjoying my time with it, but yes, I can already confirm that I miss the crazy single-player campaigns that the uh, Black Ops titles are known for, but I really like the Blackout mode. It is really, really fun. It doesn't really deviate all that much from, uh, you know, the other Battle Royale experiences that are out there, it's sort of in general terms, uh, but it's, it's fun. It's just really fun. It's easy to play, and, and uh, uh, the competition is fierce, and you feel like you're a badass by just sort of, uh, you know, hiding somewhere for a little while until, poof, you're dead. Start again. Uh, but yeah, I think it's cool. I'll definitely have a review for you as soon as humanly possible, but uh, I'm playing it and I'm digging it. It looks like Nintendo is ready to embrace change with the Switch. They've announced a new special edition version of the console based around Diablo 3, which hits the system next month. It doesn't have anything new under the hood, but does have cool Diablo-branded artwork on the outside, similar to the Super Smash Bros. Ultimate version of the system landing in December. The bundle also comes with the game, obviously, and a Diablo-branded character 
carrying case. In Canada, it will set you back 450 bucks and will only be available at EB Games. Looking ahead, Nintendo is rumored to be working on a redesigned Switch 2.0 that will have better hardware, although don't expect to hear any official announcements about that until at least next year. Uh, I think this is cool. We're gonna have branded Switch consoles out there. I think it's crazy that there is a Diablo Nintendo machine. Who would have called that? I mean, it's a great fit, and I can't wait to play Diablo on the Switch, but who would have called... Because I think Diablo is still an M-rated game, is it not? I think it is, but it, it's just such a crazy idea that there is a, uh, a game set in hell that's on a Nintendo platform, and you can have all of that artwork etched all over it. I think we're going to see a lot more of this. I think that the uh, the Switch is a modular machine, and I think there's going to be some interesting, um, you know, permutations of the device as it exists now. And yes, for sure, we will get an enhanced Switch down the road. Absolutely count on it. The Switch is just a, it's a solid, uh, you know, kind of new salvo for Nintendo. What is it, what is going to be very interesting is to hear what the plans are for any kind of a portable solution going forward. Perhaps what we kind of know as the 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 switch um, you know uh, tech specs as they exist today are going to evolve into an a, a handheld only version of the machine that will play these carts and the downloaded software but it'll be priced a little bit cheaper or maybe it'll have a little bit of a smaller screen or something but it will have the same hardware specs uh, that exist right now that way developers could um, you know have their games exist in multiple different formats but not have to create uh, a brand new piece of code or a brand new piece of software out there they would just have to kind of scale up to the top end of what whatever the switch 2.0 ends up being um, interesting days for Nintendo this is what happens when you have massive success you just have to uh, you kind of have to live with your success and roll with all of the new challenges that they present all right, it turns out that the immortal Iron Fist wasn't so immortal after all. The superhero show has officially been canceled after two seasons. Marvel and Netflix haven't revealed why they've killed the series, although it was never as popular with audiences as the other Defender shows like Daredevil and Jessica Jones. And since the cancellation is coming just a month after the second season, it's a safe bet that the numbers just weren't there. The good news for Iron Fist fans is that Marvel and Netflix say that while the series on Netflix has ended, the immortal Iron Fist will live on. That means we could see the character pop up in other shows, and there will obviously be new comics and other stories down the road. Marvel and Netflix may have just watched my review of season one and two as well and said, ah, that's it. No, I'm, I'm kidding. I just reviewed it, and people have been tweeting me and saying, look, the show's canceled. See what you did? And uh, yeah, the show was not good. And I've been thinking about what they could do with Iron Fist. They could make it like a 70s exploitation kind of show with lots of sort of saturated colors and a lot of pop. And the villains could have weapons that aren't just traditional handguns and, and swords, but they could have badass powers, you know, alien-infused weapons or something to kind of counteract the, uh, the supernatural elements that Iron Fist kind of embodies. And I would like to see him in the costume, and I would like to see him be a superhero and just, you know, kapow! Almost like The Last Dragon. Remember The Last Dragon movie from the... Nobody remembers that. But it was it was a good uh, cult film, and it had a sense of humor and cool characters. And with, uh, with the... You know, they wouldn't even have to recast. They just kind of retool and, and sort of embrace it. They kind of lean in that direction a little bit at the very end of season two, because it, it sort of cranks up the cheese ball a little bit. Um, but we don't know these characters as that, you know? And I think that might have been part of the problem with the way that it, Iron Fist was framed with Daredevil and Jessica Jones and Luke, because all of those other shows are a little dour and dark and uh, twisted and depressive a little bit, and they fit those heroes. But with Iron Fist, this is a guy that should have kind of like a Buddhist kind of, uh, uh, you know, center and a little bit of an appreciation for his ability to, you know, reinvest into society and have fun with it. You know, that was the biggest problem with Iron Fist. It just wasn't fun. And, uh, you, you know, if they work him into the, to the series again or if they retool and they build something new or uh, the other rumor is that Disney's going to launch a, an Iron Fist show on, um, on their streaming service, uh, I just hope it's more fun. The character can be fun. And they can also just make a Heroes for Hire show and put Luke Cage and Iron Fist together and make that fun too. Uh, but listen, uh, I, I'm not terribly sad to see Iron Fist go. <laughs> All right, guys, that's going to do it for our rundown today. Thank you so much for watching that. Now it's time to move on to this day and everything cool.